Imagine you are the ruler of an Italian city in the Renaissance. Your husband has just been murdered and your children were taken hostage by your political enemies, who hope to take control of your fortress. Yet the people inside it are still loyal to you and are not surrendering. So, leaving your children with your enemies, you go inside the castle, having promised them you will persuade those inside to surrender. Otherwise, your children will die. Once inside the fortress, though, you start shouting threats at your enemies, promising violent revenge. People are confused. What about your children? What kind of mother would risk their lives like this? And then you decide to lift up your skirts, exposing your genitals to your enemies, and you say that they can do whatever they want with your children, as you have the means to make many more of them anyway. According to Machiavelli, who was representing Florence in the negotiations, this is what Caterina Sforza, the Countess of Imola and Forlì in Italy's Romagna, did. And yes, his retelling of the story in his book The Discourses is very likely an exaggeration of what really happened, but it does hint at her character. As you can tell, her contemporaries saw Caterina as a brave and fierce woman. She occupied Castel Sant'Angelo in Rome after the death of Pope Sixtus IV, and she bravely resisted military attacks by Cesare Borgia. She was even later accused of having poisoned his father, Pope Alexander VI, and was imprisoned for a while. This was not an implausible accusation at all, like many noble women of her time, including her descendant, Catherine de' Medici. Caterina knew a thing or two about poisons. In fact, according to many contemporary sources, she was one of the most accomplished alchemists of her time. So, let's talk about Renaissance women, alchemy and medicine, through one of the most interesting characters of this period, Caterina Sforza, the Tigress of Forlì. Hello, lovely history fans. I'm Dr. Julia Martins, and I'm a historian of gender and medicine. I study how the body was understood in the past and how that shapes the present. I'm particularly interested in women's roles in the development of scientific knowledge, and it's hard to think of a better example to talk about this than Caterina Sforza. She's also, in my opinion, one of the most interesting women of all time. If you're new here, hi and welcome. Please consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, and remember to give a thumbs up to this video if you enjoy it. I also do have a Patreon um, if you would like to support my work and help me keep making history videos. So, let's dive into the fascinating world of elixirs to prolong life, treatments for sick horses, ways of making invisible ink, remedies for gout, poisons and their antidotes, recipes to reverse aging, formulas to protect you from the plague, and ways of adding weight to coins to increase their value. Let's talk about Caterina Sforza's experiments and Renaissance female alchemists. Before we talk about her recipe for a 60-year-old woman to look like a 20-year-old girl, let's first set the scene. Caterina was the daughter of Duke Galeazzo Sforza and his mistress, Lucrezia Landriani, and despite being illegitimate, Caterina was raised and educated in the Milanese court. Caterina was good friends with her father's second wife, Bona Maria di Savoia, and it may have been through her, her stepmother, and her apothecary, Cristoforo di Burugora, that Caterina was first introduced to the world of scientific experimentation. Like many apothecaries of his day, Cristoforo had a medicinal garden, and so did Caterina when she was older. She cultivated medicinal herbs in Imola and in Forlì, besides raising wild animals of all sorts. At just 14 years old, Caterina was married to Girolamo Moriario, the nephew of the then Pope Sixtus IV. It was probably during the time between her arrival in Forlì in 1484 and Girolamo's assassination in 1488 that she really started experimenting seriously and focusing on alchemy. Together, the couple seemed to have worked towards creating an image of themselves as great, magnificent princes and their court one to rival even the Medici. And, as we'll see, alchemy was a big part of that. Her contemporaries described Caterina as an example of ideal feminine beauty. Jacopo Filippo Foresti da Bergamo, her biographer, described her in 1497 as one of the most beautiful women of our century, of elegant appearance and blessed with a marvellous figure. 
which is particularly impressive after having children. Anyway, you can see this in this depiction of her by Lorenzo Cradi. You can see how she also had the fashionable strawberry blonde hair favored at the time. And if you're interested in learning about hair in this period, I do have a video about that, which you might find interesting. Anyway, although she was admired for her beauty, Caterina was even more renowned for her political leadership and for just being a strong, fearless, incredible woman. And you can see how I, I tend to agree with Machiavelli. Anyway, Isabella d'Este, who was another powerful woman and an alchemist herself, wrote that if the French condemn the cowardice of Italian men, they must at least recognize the daring and valor of Italian women. She clearly looked up to Caterina as well. Although Machiavelli also admired her character and audacity, the story he told also hints at her at Catalina being a sort of unnatural mother, someone who preferred losing her children to giving up her power. But although there are many period dramas showing her political leadership, like the Medici and the Borgias, this is only one of the things that made her such a remarkable character. As I mentioned, like many aristocratic women of her time, Caterina was very interested in scientific experimentation, and she was happy to learn from all kinds of sources, from um, learned texts, the accounts of her friends and family, from popular tradition, and of course, from her direct practical experience. And for her, this was very much not just what we would call um, a hobby. She wasn't just experimenting for fun, even though it must have been intellectually satisfying. There are so many examples of noble and royal women who were interested in alchemy in the Renaissance, not to mention cosmetics and medicine, such as uh, Catherine de' Medici, queen and regent of France, who, according to many, was particularly knowledgeable about poisons. Other examples include Isabella d'Este, the Marchioness of Mantua, uh, who I just mentioned, who was famous for making her own perfumes and giving them out as gifts, and Marie de Medici, another queen of France and a relative of Caterina Sforza, whose alchemical lab was famous. This may sound like a coincidence, like all these women just shared the same weird pastime or something. Indeed, collecting recipes, or secrets as they were sometimes called, was a distraction for both men and women. Sure, although noble women were known as particularly interested in beauty formulas. But this was not just a hobby. To understand why alchemy and female alchemists were so important, we have to think of what these women were responsible for in their homes. So, one of the things that whenever there are discussions about women and work I tend to find annoying is the implication that women have only recently joined the workforce. Uh, there are, of course, many layers here in terms of time and place, considering uh, race and class and the differences between work inside and outside the home and between paid work and unpaid work, which I, I won't get into. But my point is that women have, throughout history, and with few exceptions, pretty much always worked, even if the definition of what that work means has changed. So let me explain. Someone like Caterina Sforza, or any of the noble women I mentioned, was expected to work and to be responsible for lots of different things. She had political and diplomatic roles representing Forli and Imola, but she also had much to do within the court. Usually, women managed the household, raising children, taking care of domestic animals, making cosmetics and hygiene products such as soap, brewing ale, cooking, cleaning and washing which also involved making stain removers, for instance, plus managing accounts, taking care of the health of those living with them, uh, preventing and treating illness, for instance. So women were the first part of call when someone was in bad health. Of course, I'm not saying that Caterina Sforza was scrubbing floors. Someone like her would have plenty of servants, whom she was also responsible for. If a maid un unexpectedly fell pregnant, for instance, if someone had a rash or a fever, they would resort to her, the lady of the house, to care for them. So domestic medicine in this period goes beyond a peasant woman helping her neighbor who was giving birth. Women of higher social status and wealth were expected to take care of those beneath them in the social hierarchy. There was also, of course, an element of charity here as well. For instance, many religious institutions run by both men and women, would be involved in taking care of the health of those in their communities, including lay people. There were, uh, for instance, apothecary nuns, nuns who made their own medicines in their convents and who acted as sort of community healers. And 
well, these nuns, they really do deserve their own video. But um, you see, if you expand the concept of household and domestic to see convents and courts as great houses, then you can easily see how women, by virtue of caring for those around them and the household, were central to this world of experimentation and management. Noble households were like communities where knowledge of all kinds was shared. Of course, Italian courts varied in size. They could be made up of dozens, but sometimes even hundreds of people, who would have many different concerns. With so many women as part of the household, it's easy to see why recipes about the female body, such as dealing with menstrual problems, would be useful. Practical knowledge about reproduction, such as dealing with infertility, would be important for securing an heir, for instance. But this medical knowledge would also enable people to circulate medical advice within their circles, which would also be helpful when dealing with medical practitioners, be they surgeons, physicians, or midwives. Some of this knowledge could be considered problematic, though. Besides magic, recipes connected to deception weren't always considered acceptable. I'm thinking of uh, ways to make a woman who is no longer a virgin seem like one. There were lots of recipes for that. Anyway, but women, uh, women running large households had to sort of be prepared for anything that might come their way, from the plague to dealing with digestive and respiratory issues, uh, sciatica or melancholy. So it's not surprising that someone like Caterina would be interested in medical and cosmetic recipes, many of which relied on alchemy and were born from the everyday lives of women, from the household economy. This was the time of domestic alchemy and kitchen physic. Remember, household medicine was the main way of caring for those who were ill until the 19th century. And until the Industrial Revolution, most cosmetics, cleaning products, and everyday household items such as ink would have been made at home. This is why so many of these recipe collections are organized in eclectic ways. You have recipes for preserving strawberries and curing meat next to recipes for making soap, hair dyes, facial creams, um, stain removers, not to mention recipes uh, for the plague and formulas to enhance milk supply if you were breastfeeding. It's a mix of household management, healing, cosmetics, and cooking. In a sophisticated household, alchemy would have an important place. Its two main goals, turning base metals into gold and creating an elixir to prolong youth and restore health, were not only the pursuit of learned men, especially since the printing press had come along. Also, this kind of knowledge had practical application. The recipes about metals could be used in jewelry making, or to make silver or gold threads for embroidery, or even to make fake pearls if your budget didn't allow you to buy real ones. So for a Renaissance lady like Caterina, complex skills were needed, were required to run a household. These practical needs, from healing a horse who had worms to helping a maid terminate an unwanted pregnancy, were combined in Caterina's recipes with her intellectual interest in experimentation. Even when she had a recipe that already worked for whatever goal she, she hoped to achieve, she would try it out to try to improve it, um, to make a hair dye last longer, to make a remedy taste or smell better, to make a face cream's texture smoother, for instance. She would also try out different versions of the recipe using other ingredients for when something wasn't available. It's not too different from a baker today experimenting with a cake recipe to make it vegan or gluten-free. In this process, Caterina would try out many recipes on herself, her friends and her family, testing their efficacy but also relying on people's feedback. And helpfully, for, for historians at least, she would track these changes and we can see how this experimentation was one of the main ways through which people at the time could understand nature and the world around them, not to mention their own bodies. This is probably why recipe books are, are my favorite, I think, kind of primary source for studying gender history and the history of medicine. Women and men use them to track and record experiments, annotating recipes. They might scribble something on the margins like tested and proven by myself or even not true to indicate that something hadn't worked, for instance. So recipes are a source into the world of empirical knowledge and experimentation of the time and often of women's engagement with early modern science, medicine and empiricism. I mean, Household recipe books, like Caterina's Farces, have been described as the most prevalent form of women's authoritative writing in Renaissance Europe. 
they were the most common way for women to write about this, to write about medicine, cosmetics and alchemy, and these texts were the basis for female authority in these areas. Besides having familiar and personal utility, Caterina's interest in scientific experimentation also had a political component. These recipes could be useful for maintaining and expanding her political power and influence, which I will talk about in a bit. But let's now talk about her experiments. One of the most remarkable manuscript collections of recipes from the Renaissance is, without a doubt, Caterina's Fortes. So throughout her life, Caterina never stopped developing her collection of recipes, which survives in a single copy, simply titled Experimenti, or Experiments. There are over 450 eclectic formulas compiled during her lifetime, the majority of them medicinal, but many of them cosmetic and alchemical, and lots of them about veterinary medicine. This mix of recipes was presented as a sort of toolbox from which readers and Caterina herself could pick and choose, finding the ideal tool for solving everyday life problems, which is why you can find everything from taking care of your personal appearance, uh, making the domestic environment nice and pleasant, and those around you and yourself healthy. In terms of beauty, we're talking about skin lotions, colors for the face, um, which is what we would call makeup today, uh, beauty waters and hair dyes. Caterina's cosmetic recipes even included ways of modifying the body shape. There's a recipe for keeping breasts small, uh, following the beauty standards of the time, called to make the breasts small and hard so that they do not grow any larger. And it goes like this. And again, <laughs> Please don't try this at home, regardless of what your breasts may look like. Take hemlock juice and use it daily. Even if the breasts are large, they shall become small. If you are still girls and have not yet matured, if you use this formula every day, they, your breasts, will not grow larger and will remain beautiful and firm. In terms of medicine, there are recipes for the mundane, such as dealing with lice, to the more complicated like gout, epilepsy and even tumors. Caterina had remedies for all of those and, although many of them wouldn't have worked, especially those for cancer, some of them would definitely have helped, at least with symptoms. Plus, there was a recipe for an opium-based anesthetic to make patients sleep for surgeries, which, I mean, that must have been very helpful. Still, the most valuable and renowned of her recipes were probably the Philosopher's Stone, one of the most important alchemical quests, and a quintessence, so an elixir to protect against illness, cure all diseases, and prolong youth. Her panaceas included this elixir vitae, or vital elixir, which was made by distilling herbs in a sealed glass alembic. It was believed to be so powerful that it could even raise the dead, allegedly. So she wrote, it causes a person to regain his youth and brings the dead back to life. And if someone were so ill as to have been abandoned by his physicians as an incurable case, it will restore him to health. Hmm, quite the statement. Anyway, you can see how there's an element of the miraculous, an element of magic in some of her medical recipes, especially the ones connected to alchemy. These recipes were linked to her political concerns as well. I mean, this was a turbulent time, and there was always intrigue at court. It might be useful to have invisible ink for secret letters, for instance. Plus, poisons, along with their antidotes, very, very important, they were always good to have an, a, at hand, and Caterina wasn't the only one to think so. One of the formulas in her collection was even attributed to Pope Paul II, and it was made with distilled scorpions. <laughs> I mean... Naturally, many of these were dangerous and perhaps best kept secret, which is why they were written fully or partially in Latin rather than Italian, or even written in cipher to keep their secrecy. Caterina's collection indicates her experimental methodology and her intellectual curiosity, and it's also representative of how highly educated people at the time engaged and created knowledge. We know she personally tested them, the recipes, multiple times. Um, well, except for the ones like the scorpion um, recipe, I guess, I, the one I just mentioned. So just to be sure of the desired results, she would make marginal annotations next to her formulas saying things like truly tested and proven, uh, proven and certain, or proven remedy. Caterina Sforza was still working on her collection when she died in 1509. Throughout her life, she was known to keep a notebook on her at all times to make notes, including of recipes. She never stopped experimenting. 
After her first husband had been murdered, she married Giovanni di Pier Francesco de' Medici, called Il Popolano, and they had a son, who would become the renowned condottiere Giovanni de' Medici. Her recipes were then passed on to him, her youngest son, also called Giovanni dalle Bandenere, who was a condottiere and the father of the first Medici Grand Duke, Cosimo I. It was a trusted lieutenant serving under Giovanni, Luca Antonio Cupano, who transcribed Caterina's recipes around 1525 as a sort of useful pastime while, while he was stationed, calling them these most treasured things. Cupano wrote, One must assume the recipes to be effective, for they have been proven so by this great lady. The manuscript is over 500 pages long and bound in leather. Luckily, it also comes with a code, since, as I mentioned, some of the recipes were encrypted, especially those dealing with alchemy and poisons. Apparently, Luc Antonio copied this from the original as well. In the 19th century, the collection was published for the first time by Caterina's biographer, Pier Desiderio Pasolini, who called it the most complete and important known document on medicine and perfumes of the Renaissance, and he also described it as a foundational text in the history of pharmacology. But that's not the end of the story. And that's the coolest thing. This is the coolest thing about studying history, I think. You never know when a new document will be found, when a new primary source will appear, found by an archivist or a librarian, and essentially making our work possible. Two manuscripts have recently been discovered at the National Library in Florence. An index referencing another collection of recipes by Caterina, possibly over a thousand of them, and a further 400-something extra transcribed recipes, so a second volume of her experiments. Plus, there are some recipes in the index that don't appear in any of the two volumes of recipes, so who knows, there might even be a third collection hiding, hiding somewhere. Hopefully we'll find, we'll find it eventually. Anyway, this indicates that Caterina may have collected and developed thousands of recipes throughout her life. These new documents showcase how experiential knowledge was authoritative, not just in the domestic world, but beyond it too, and how Caterina was an alchemical and medical experimenter, as well as an author and a political leader. Someone like her was exceptional, of course, but although not all Renaissance women had her talent, not to mention the time and resources to experiment, Caterina's case highlights one of the main ways in which women engaged with the scientific and medical culture at the time, right before what would later be called the scientific revolution. As I said, uh, women used recipes to manage their health and appearance as well as that of those around them, and manage their families and households. This is why this kind of collection tended to be so eclectic, reflecting the empirical and experimental character of early modern scientific culture based on the domestic world and everyday life. This is particularly true for women. If you were a Renaissance woman who, like Caterina, was curious about the world around you, what else could you do but experiment at home, dedicating yourself to household alchemy and kitchen physic? You couldn't participate in most professional guilds, you weren't welcome at universities. Plus, this is what was a useful occupation for women, as it would make them better at managing their households. Focusing on your recipe book could be a way of developing an investigative practice and intellectual inquiry. They were a way for women to cement their authority as healers and enable them to take part in discussions about natural philosophy and science. In Caterina's case, this involved her political and ceremonial duties at court as well. Her collection is very much at the origins of a long involvement of the Medici family with experimentation and alchemy, um, and in medicine and cosmetics, and this continued to be consulted, this collection, for decades, with new readers adapting the recipes to new times. Caterina's recipes were united by their pragmatic nature. The thing they all had in common was that they were useful. Her managerial and political duties were complex, and so was her collection of recipes. I mean, I know it might seem weird to have recipes for making vinegar and artillery weapons in the same book, but it would have made sense for someone like her. Most of the recipe titles indicated the recipe's function, with a note sometimes mentioning whether it had been given to Caterina by an acquaintance, especially if it was someone with a prominent reputation. This random method of collecting recipes was common at the time, both for manuscript and for printed recipe books. Roughly, half of these recipes had to do with medicine. 
a quarter were alchemical, around 10% were for cosmetics, and a further 10% involved magic. The remaining 5% of recipes dealt mostly with veterinary medicine and equine remedies. Horses were, of course, crucial for transport and agriculture, but also for warfare. And in the 15th century, their ceremonial role in the world of courtly spectacle and splendor was crucial for Renaissance culture. So it was very important to take care of your horses, which is why Caterina listed formulas. Formulas like to make a horse's hooves perfect and to harden bad glass-like hooves, plus how to treat worms in horses and to fatten sick animals. I mean, interestingly, Caterina wrote down that some of these recipes would even work on people as well, presumably not in the same dose. Many of these recipes were based on distilling herbs. Distillation was used both in traditional Galenic medicine and in alchemy too. It required specialized but not necessarily expensive equipment, and Caterina made sure to list all the essential tools and items you would need. Alchemy and distillation were increasingly popular at the time, especially in medicine. And well, if you're interested in that, you might want to watch my video on Paracelsus, which is all about distillation. Anyway, distillation involved specific methods, processes and techniques, often using chemical ingredients and Although there could be elements from esotericism and arcana, much of alchemy was household alchemy and its cousin, kitchen physic, both of which were practiced by women. And so, although Caterina Sforza is probably one of the most remarkable alchemists of her time, she was by no means the only one. So let's talk about how this knowledge circulated. Caterina Sforza has been described as an avid prince practitioner, as she developed a public persona as a practitioner and purveyor of secrets, as someone who was fascinated with secrets, with useful recipes for everyday life, and valuable ways of getting ahead politically. But while some recipes were indeed kept secret, and secrecy was an important element in the perceived value of a recipe, remember that some of them were even encrypted, these recipes were also frequently on the move. As I mentioned earlier, these collections were often passed down from one generation to the next, like a family heirloom. They circulated within family and friend circles and the local community. Recipe collections were part of the dowry for the daughters of artisans in Italy, containing useful trade secrets, which makes sense when you think that many people would marry within their guild or circle of craftsmen. Brides from the nobility also often brought familial recipe books with them when they married. And this makes me think of, it's so funny, but it makes me think of when one of my cousins was getting married in Brazil a few years ago, and we were all asked to bring a recipe when we came to her bridal shower. So that all of these, um, all of our contributions essentially became her own recipe collection, the basis for her own future experimentation. I mean, of course, there's some sexism involved, and most of us had brought recipes for cake, uh, not the Philosopher's Stone, but it just goes to show how throughout history, Recipes have been one of the key ways for knowledge to circulate, but also for people to bond, expanding and consolidating social networks. So, there were many ways in which recipes would be shared and medical knowledge would be disseminated. I mean, and that goes for across linguistic, political, social and gender boundaries. But recipes were also a form of currency and they circulated through a wide and intricate epistolary network. Caterina Sforza even sent out people to seek out new recipes for her, visiting other courts and especially other noble women who were also interested in experimentation. People would write down recipes in their letters, whether they were aristocrats, or medical practitioners such as apothecaries, or political agents like diplomats. They could be sent as reciprocal gifts, um, as a mark of favor um, to establish goodwill or cement alliances. Recipes serve to maintain and expand these networks, bolstering the authority and the reputation of those who share the most valuable recipes. If you shared a recipe with someone above your social rank, it could help make your case in asking for patronage or receiving financial reward. Caterina frequently corresponded with her apothecary in Forlì, with the Dominican nuns of Annalena and the Benedictine convent of Le Murate, where she had been a boarder and where later she would be buried. Her correspondence um, with the nuns included this uh, exchange of recipes, especially about medicine. 
Hundreds of letters were exchanged, and some of her correspondents um, included Lorenzo de' Medici in Florence, Isabella d'Este in Mantua, um, Lodovico Sforza, her uncle, in Milan, and Federico Gonzaga in Ferrara. So, recipes acted as currency in political alliances. They represented counsel and intelligence and appeared often in Caterina's political letters, as she promised recipes as a part of political negotiations. So, you can see how this crafting of her persona, or self-fashioning, as some historians call it, deeply involved her recipes. Caterina crafted her political authority by intertwining it with her scientific authority. She carefully blended both and fashioned herself as a sort of prince practitioner. And part of that aura had to do with secrecy. Caterina was very discreet in her experimental practice, as, as the encoded formulas indicate, and so were many of her contemporaries. For instance, in a letter sent to Caterina, only signed that faithful servant, it is mentioned that two recipes were going to be exchanged between Caterina Sforza and possibly Isabella d'Este, following some previous arrangement. Caterina would receive a special facial lotion and would reciprocate this with a formula for making 19 karat gold. Yes, it is implied that these had a similar value, so this just goes to show how valuable cosmetic formulas could be. And that's not surprising. Aristocratic Italian women were renowned for their knowledge of cosmetics and perfumes. Isabella described herself as unsurpassed by any perfumer in the world, and these gifts had a high value in European courts at the time. Unfortunately, though, we don't know anything about this mysterious servant, and the fact that they signed the letter this way further indicates the importance of discretion. Although many of her correspondents were from the nobility like herself, Caterina's interest in experimentation transcended class and status. We know she exchanged cosmetic recipes with an unlicensed practitioner called Anna Ebrea, or Jewish Anna, who sent Caterina a recipe for softening the skin and removing spots, similar to a face mask. And if you're intrigued about Anna, remember that Jewish people had been expelled from many kingdoms by then, including Castile, and many of them had relocated to Italian cities. Many Jewish women were known for their knowledge of cosmetics and medicine. In some cases, this could be a way in. This opened opportunities for them, for marginalized people at court, becoming well-known in this sort of marketplace of secrets. Plus, this interest in cosmetics transcended social class. While many noble women developed their own creams and beauty products, their recipes were also diffused in great part through elite women, like the wives of, of merchants, who were keen to copy them from their hairstyles to their makeup. So, by exchanging recipes and buying these products at the apothecary, these women gained access to higher levels of society, but also to a world of experimentation. Another way this knowledge circulated was when elite women wanted to reward servants and just didn't have money or cash on hand. Cosmetic recipes or products were often used for that purpose, and they were happily received. They were symbols of social capital, and they consolidated hierarchies and networks. Through these connections, Caterina's collection grew, and we know that she prescribed recipes for others. Her daughter, for instance, wrote to her asking for advice about respiratory problems. And in return for one of her mother's recipes, she would send Caterina some fruit. No detail about that. Anyway, besides that, Caterina swapped alchemical formulas with Maximilian I, who had married her sister, Bianca Maria Sforza, and who would be the Holy Roman Emperor from 1508. So, Caterina had extensive contacts across Europe, especially at courts, to whom she would send her recipes. And she would receive many others in exchange to expand her own collection. And this is what historians have called court experimentalism, and in which Caterina's descendants, the Medici, excelled. So, Renaissance recipes had a rich social life, and these books could always be annotated by current users, with new recipes being added and older ones being corrected or improved. Caterina's formulas are similar to many of her contemporaries, from fellow alchemists to at court uh, to what apothecaries would prepare in their workshops, relying on many different intellectual frameworks, from the alchemical to the magical, the divine, the occult to the humoral theory, so prevalent in her day, which I always mention, which was the case uh, for many re Renaissance healers. We know there was much communication happening between the world of female experimenters like Sforza and the more formal world of medical and scientific experimentation. 
One of the main differences, though, is that for people like Katerina, the dozens of recipes dealing with metals could have a clear political and economic use. For instance, one of her recipes was meant to add greater weight to a scudo, or golden ducat, increasing its value, and it was attributed to Cosimo the Elder. Alchemical recipes like this indicate how she thought of the practical application of alchemy to her political needs. I mean, the need for money to maintain a courtly household was a constant worry, and so Caterina's interest in alchemy could potentially create extra resources for her court, and she discussed this in, in letters with those in her inner circle. Besides adding to the weight of coins, uh, changing the color of metals and making fake jewelry would definitely come in handy, and of course recipes for making steel weapons and metalworking in general would be useful for warfare. I find it so interesting to think that alchemical methods were behind both these kinds of needs and formulas for beauty products and hygiene. It just goes to show the real and complex demands of life at a Renaissance court in all its diversity. Even amidst political turmoil and personal tragedy, Caterina continued to experiment and to exchange letters and recipes with her networks. Recipes cemented relationships, they circulated through networks by word of mouth, uh, letters, manuscript collections and printed books. And through these recipes, we can map how practical and empirical knowledge flowed between courts and cities. Plus, we can see how women were a big part of the world of experimentation. I mean, from a gendered perspective, though, things weren't always straightforward. Let's talk about censorship. As I mentioned, after Caterina's death, her recipes were handed down to her son, Giovanni de' Medici, and later to his son, Cosimo de' Medici, the first Medici Grand Duke. Francesco I and Don Antonio de' Medici inherited the collection after that, and they put lots of effort and resources into expanding Caterina's legacy. They created large laboratories. Cosimo's foundry at the Palazzo Vecchio was a place where recipes were tested and perfected, and new scientific endeavors were pursued. These labs and workshops were scientific and technological hubs. They produced porcelain and glass and investigated all kinds of pyrotechnics and alchemical formulas. But not everything was going smoothly for Caterina Sforza's collection of recipes. Like I said earlier, we can read an eclectic mix of recipes with a household economy in mind, but also with the need to serve both the health and the political goals of a Renaissance court, in which her authority, political and scientific, was largely based on her experiential bodily knowledge. However, these manuscripts, even though they weren't meant for a large readership, but for familial use, were not immune to criticism and censorship. Recipes in printed books were, of course, much more heavily censored, especially where magic and the occult were concerned. The best example is perhaps the polemic around Giambattista della Porta and his witch's ointment, uh, which deserves its own video, and I'll make it eventually, I promise. <laughs> Some of her recipes were deliberately censored in two different ways, through excision, which is when you literally cut out parts of the text, and obliteration, which is when you paint or scribble over the offending parts of the text, making it illegible. This was done after Cupano's first transcription of the recipes, which had been very faithful to the original, possibly at the time of Cosimo de' Medici. The Pope at the time, Paul III, was an enemy of the Medici. Times were tense. The Pope had even started to authorize that private homes be searched by the Inquisition. This meant that a manuscript family collection of recipes made the Medici vulnerable to possible accusations of heresy. Who knows, maybe the family thought that some of the experimental aspects of her collection, which dealt with magic, could be understood as demonic. They could be a threat to the Medici. So it's likely that this was a voluntary self-censorship of sorts. Maybe they just wanted to prote protect themselves by removing anything problematic from the collection. Crucially, the new recipe books that were created from then on within the Medici court tended not to include any magic at all. Of course, it's always a shame for historians when something like this happens, but we have to accept that we almost never get to know the whole story. Still, the partial censorship of Caterina Sforza's collection and her intellectual legacy hints at big changes happening at the time, especially of what was considered acceptable and forbidden, not only in terms of religion, but also in terms of medicine and science. Still, 
some of Caterina's recipes were later considered unacceptable, especially the ones dealing with magic. Whether it was symbolic, ritual, demonic, or natural magic, magic was one of the operative principles behind many of her recipes, and the same can be said for many of her contemporaries, in all fairness. Some kinds of magic were considered okay, and others weren't, and what exactly constituted each changed according to time and place, but this was a very fine line. This was also a gendered question, with knowledge coming from women being more problematic too. Yet for a long time, it was believed that natural phenomena could be sometimes explained by spirits and the invisible properties of things, such as the force of magnets, which, if you don't understand the science behind them, can seem marvelous and, who knows, connected with other elements of the occult. Manipulating and operating using these invisible forces was considered magic, and it had been for, for centuries. But things were changing in the 16th century. The Reformation had made discussions about heresy and demonology a central concern of the Church. And let's not forget, it's no coincidence that the early modern period was when the witch craze took Europe by storm. In this context, magic was increasingly defined in a broader sense, encompassing even more practices than it had before. So the line between what kind of knowledge was forbidden and what was acceptable was being redrawn. And that is very likely why, in the second collection of recipes re recently uncovered, some recipes were considered unorthodox, especially the ones for charms uh, or using spells and incantations. And we know this in large part because of the index, which lists the recipe's titles. Caterina Sforza was a remarkable Renaissance prince, in the sense of a political leader. Her military and diplomatic strategies are well known, and her ways of developing her authority and persona have been discussed by historians and depicted in novels and films and art for a long time. And rightly so. But her alchemical life is just as interesting, if not more so, at least to me. Her recipes give us a unique insight into the lives of early modern women and their involvement with experimentation and scientific inquiry. Caterina was fascinated with secrets, with recipes that were use, useful or valuable for the running of a large household. Because she was responsible for the health of her family, guests and servants, and because of the needs of a Renaissance court, from the well-being of horses to the weight of coins, she crafted a long collection of recipes covering everything from medicine, cosmetics, perfumes, alchemy, magic and metalworking. She was clearly enthralled with these experiments, but they were also a part of her domestic duties. And recipes like these fascinated people at court. But they were also starting to appear in print. And soon, the market would be flooded with these books. By the way, let me know if you would be interested in, in a video about printed recipe books, which were bestsellers at the time. When Caterina Sforza died of quartan fever in 1509, it was said that her apothecary was distraught. And no wonder. Caterina had become such a central figure in the world of Renaissance experimentation. She was a matriarch, the founding figure of the long history of scientific experimentation at the Medici court and beyond. She was an alchemical, alchemical mother of sorts. Many of her recipes survived, luckily for us, and they were amended, transcribed, and used by her descendants and admirers. Although Caterina's eclectic collection of recipes was born from the everyday management of a household and the domestic world, it soon expanded to cover new ground, connected to her political role and making her a pioneer of a kind of new science and empiricism without which it's debatable whether we would have had a scientific revolution. Caterina's many overlapping roles, wife, mother, duchess and regent from 1484 to 1499, shaped her recipe collection, making it a window into the everyday life of a Renaissance court. Plus, she was just incredibly intelligent and resourceful. Anyway, you can see I admire her, but anyway, if you're still with me, Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I always like to read them and I make sure to reply everyone. Also, if you enjoy my ramblings on history, please consider becoming a patron over at Patreon. It really does make a difference. Thank you and see you next time.